This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. My very first job when I was 14 was working as a line cook in a fast food burger place. It was a hot and disgusting and frankly pretty awful job. And to this day, I can still never get the smell of grease off of those work shirts. Back in those days, at one point we used to sell a burger called the Tropicano. It was a pretty standard burger, except that it came with a ring of pineapple in the middle. And whatever your thoughts are on pineapple, it was a pretty popular burger. We used to only sell this burger for like two weeks a year. And in that time, we would have to special order in these pineapple rings from a company over east. But time and time again, the pineapple would be late. It would not arrive, and sometimes it just come in the wrong quantity. And with no pineapple, you can't make a Tropicano. It would always boggle my mind each night that we could make the whole burger, but if this one ingredient didn't come through, we couldn't make the Tropicano, the thing everyone was looking for. The whole burger doesn't work without one key ingredient, an ingredient we relied on from a separate company to supply. This is actually the exact problem electronics and defense companies are facing today. Except instead of tins of pineapple, those special ingredients are rare earths. If you look at the bottom of a periodic table, you can see two rows of elements separated from the rest. The lanthanides and the actinides. Elements you've probably never thought about, like neodymium, terbium, promethium, and thorium, are key elements that make up our phones, our computers, our satellites, and batteries. It's the thing that makes them all work. But the amount of refined materials around is actually quite small, and the amount of countries that produce it is even smaller. In many cases, China and Australia are the only places you can go to get these crucial materials. And even then, China is the only one that can convert them from dirt to the compounded element. If we look at something like the state-of-the-art US fighter, the F-35, that jet requires pounds upon pounds of these small rare earths to function. These elements, found throughout the electronics, the sensors, the gyroscopes, the tail fins, you cannot make an F-35 without a bunch of rare earths. And right now, you can't get those rare earths without going through China, who dominates something like 98.5% of the rare earth market. So how did we get here? And are we at the point where China is crucial in the supply chain to build the very US jets that would be used in combat against them in a future engagement? Well, to go through how we got to this predicament, we turn to my first guest. Part 1. The weak link in the supply chain. Rare earths are absolutely critical elements, resource for our everyday lives. We don't know their existence. Uh, We talk about 15 metals, such as europium, gadolinium, uh, neodymium, lutetium. But they are absolutely critical for our everyday life. We couldn't live one single day without them. Rare earths are necessary for mobile phones. They are necessary for offshore wind turbines. You find them in most electric cars for turning the motor of the electric cars. They have exceptional physical and chemical properties, which make them very looked after minerals and metals for our modern lives. Guillaume Patron is a French journalist specializing in the raw materials sector. He is also the author of the amazing book The Rare Metals War and has gone on to write over a hundred reports on the subject. Guillaume has reported from countries all over the world ranging from China to South Africa and has gone on to win 14 French journalism awards. He joins us today. The, the name rare earth has been named back in the 18th century uh, after European geologists discovered them and they thought these metals were rare. But actually, after all, we discovered that they were not that rare. And today it's uh, not correct to talk about rare earth because actually you find deposits everywhere around the world. You could mine hundreds of mines of rare earths on different continents and even in the oceans. The thing is, when you extract a rare earth from the ground, 
they are so diluted in the Earth's crust that you will find very few of these rare Earths in every mine where you mine. So this is what makes them much more rare than base metals such as copper or iron. Let me give you an example. There is a rare Earth whose name is neodymium. And this neodymium is 1,000 more times diluted in the ocean, in the Earth's crust, than iron. So in an iron mine, you will find another metal, which is called neodymium, which is melted naturally with iron. But for extracting this neodymium, you're going to find 1,000 less of this neodymium than iron. So if you extract one kg of iron from the mine, you'll find one gram of neodymium. This is what we somehow call this metal rare, rare earths. Once we have extracted the neodymium from the iron, we tend to keep it because this neodymium has so amazing chemical and physical properties that you want to use it for uh, actually your mobile phones. Every mobile phone contains neodymium. The neodymium is contained in the magnet of the phone, which makes the vibration of the phone. If you wanted to have a magnet made of iron, for example, you would have to find a magnet which would be 10 times bigger than the actual magnet made of neodymium. And your phone would be the side of a building brick, of a building brick like it was back in the 90s. Nobody wants to have a phone which is the size of the old GSMs, right? We want to have small phones. We want to have um, uh, beautiful products in, your, in our lives. So you can see that Neodymium is one of the reasons why our lives have become smaller, our digital devices have become smaller and more easy to use. So we will use, definitely use, the neodymium for such kind of applications. So if we stay on neodymium as an example, do we have dedicated neodymium mines or is it just a process of trying to extract the neodymium from the rest of, let's the iron mine? Neodymium and the other rare earths are submetals of more abundant metals. So usually you will find them in an iron mine, for example, and you will extract the iron from the mine. You will use, you will, you will, you will uh, uh, exploit the mine for the iron it contains. And additionally, you will find these uh, so-called submetals, which you are going also to exploit, separate, and refine for their own properties. In some parts of China, Neodymium and other rare earths are so strategic and so valuable so that actually this will be the first minerals that you will extract from the ground. So you will extract obviously other minerals such as iron, but the most important thing for the Chinese miners will be to extract specifically this uh, neodymium. So you can see that even if it's a very small element, very diluted, very hard to extract, very hard to refine, very energy consuming to actually refine and transform into a metal, this is a very looked for mineral that has a huge importance for the miners which extracts them, much more, much more than iron. Many of the big mining companies like BHP, Rio Tinto and Total all have iron mines around the world, but they don't focus much on rare earths at all. Really, the only companies that do focus much on rare earths at the moment are Linus, based out of Western Australia, and a handful of Chinese-owned conglomerates. Now, if rare earths are so important to the market, why are none of the big mining companies actually focusing on it at the moment? That's a very interesting question, uh, Michael. Why... So many. So why is that that so few companies have an interest in rare earths? The reason is very simple. It's because it's too expensive to extract them. It's extremely expensive and time consuming and energy consuming to come up with a pure 100% rare earth element. And the market today doesn't uh, make the business interesting and financially rewarding for most of the, uh, of the mining companies around the world. If you want to extract the rare earths, you have to accept that you will lose money. You have to, you have to accept that you will, it will cost you more than what you get when you sell the mineral and the metal. And you have to be a Chinese company. You have to think out of the box. You have to not expect to have a short return on profit to see your interest in extracting this resource. The thing is, the Chinese understand that the good thing with rare earths is not the, man, the money they get out of it. The good thing is the strategic assets. 
the, strategi the strategic uh, advantage they get out of it and out of its business. So if you don't think in a pure capitalistic way, if you don't think about all the money that you're going to lose by extracting this, this resource, then it makes sense to extract these minerals. And this is why the Chinese, and almost only the Chinese, have actually accepted to extract these minerals. Now the Australians are starting to extract rare earths. They have been doing such kind of uh, exploitation for the last decades. Uh, there is a company whose name is Linus, which is extracting about five, seven percent of the world's rare earths. And it's very difficult for them to find a business model. And one of the reasons why they find a business model, it's because the Japanese sustain their activities and fund their activities, even if the Japanese lose money. So no one really wants to be a part of the rare earth trade because of how expensive it is to get this stuff out of the ground. The Americans used to have a large mine out at Mountain Pass in California, but they shut it down due to not making a profit, mostly because the Chinese undercut the market. They have the ability to do this because, frankly, the Chinese companies don't need to make a profit if they're owned by the state. Almost every other rare earth mine went the exact same way as the Americans' Mountain Pass mine over the 80s and 90s due to Beijing just completely undercutting them. The fundamentals of the situation haven't changed, but now the US government is looking at reopening Mountain Pass in California. So why now? If the Chinese are still going to undercut them, what makes them think it'll work this time? Very interesting. You're right. Actually, the Americans used to extract rare earths back in the 80s in California. They uh, shut down their process because it was too environmentally damaging and was getting too costly. And today, they're thinking about reopening uh, the rare earth mines. Actually, they have reopened a rare earth mine in Mountain Pass, California, because, because actually they realize that these elements are absolutely critical for their defense industry. Rare earths are necessary for smart bombs. They are necessary for the F-35 jet fighter. And the Americans don't want to be dependent upon Chinese supplies for such a strategic uh, industry. So the Americans are reopening the mine not because they will get money out of it once again, but because they don't want to be dependent on Beijing. They want to have their own mineral sovereignty. Now the problem is, Michael, once you get the, the, the mine, the, once you get the mineral out of the mine, how do you refine it? The Americans don't have the refineries, so they have to send the mineral to be refined in China. So. It's not because you have the mind that you're independent, that you're sovereign. You have to get all the downstream value chain. And this is the challenge today for the United States to not only reopen the mine of rare earths in Mountain Pass, but also to redevelop all the downstream value chain that they have closed for the last decades because they, re they were preferring that the Chinese would do them instead of them. And we'll talk more about the refining problems in China's complete dominance there a little later on in the piece. What we need to stress, though, is that this is a serious problem today. The US cannot build an F-35 fighter without a large amount of rare earths that need to be dug out of the ground and then refined completely within China before those components are then shipped off to the US to be inserted into the F-35. If war were to break out with the US, there would be no backup supply of many of these rare earths, putting a giant problem within the US supply chain. But this is not a problem you can flick a switch and solve. How long does it take to get an operation like this, a rare earth mine off of the ground? If Biden were to sign an executive order this afternoon, how long would it take to get an operation like this off the ground and actually make the US independent in their supply chain? It's always a very long process to open a mine. First, you have to explore and you have to find the good deposits. Then you have to get uh, authorization administrative permissions, you have to deal with local communities, you have to go through judiciary process if the local communities don't want you to actually extract uh, the, the minerals. Uh, so it can take up to 15 years to open a rare earth mine. Now, if you already have the rare earth mine, which has been closed 20 years ago, you want to reopen it, then it might be very quick. It could take a couple of years. So it all depends whether you already have a mine which was under operation that you just have to reopen or if you have uh, to start from scratch. Now, the thing is, once again, it's not only the I mean, it's not sufficient just to just open the mine and extract the ore. How do you refine the ore? And if you don't have the 
re refinery, so facility for refining the ore, then you know you're not completely sovereign on the whole process. So the question of opening the mine comes up with another question. How do you develop the downstream chain? And that might take, as the government accountability office in the United States once said in a report in 2010, that might take up to 15 years to develop all the supply chain to develop all the downstream value chain of the rare earth industry, not only the mine, but all the downstream chain. But even if the US get this mine off the ground, what stops China flooding the market again and crippling the already razor thin profits on these mines? If the current US plan of trying to get private companies to take up this process, you know, is it even viable without governments either the subsidizing or even part earning part of these mines? If these are crucial strategic materials, surely China can just use the same mechanism they used in the 80s and 90s to cripple any private enterprise going for this operation. But this is exactly what the Chinese do. The interest of the Chinese is to lower the price of the rare earths and to sell it at such a low price that there cannot be no competition according to capitalistic rules. So there have been uh, debates among the rare earths industry over the last years uh, over the question of whether China is actually manipulating the price, not to sell the rarest higher at a higher price, but to sell it at a lower price so that they will remain the only ones able to provide rarers to the rest of the world and there will be no competition. So the question is, how do you get out of this, of this trap? And the only way to get out of this trap and to not keep depending upon Chinese supply is actually to accept that we're going to have to lose money in order to extract these minerals. Another possibility, as the Americans want to do now, is to introduce buy American clothes, uh, which means that if you are a rare earth buyer in the United States, you have to buy the rare earth or the refined product of rare earths or the magnet of rare earths from an American producer and not from the Chinese producer. So if the Americans, if the state succeeds in uh, forbidding American industrials from getting the rare earths from the Chinese, and if they have to get the mineral from the Americans, then you can expect that there could be, could be once again a good case, a good business case for these American rare earth providers. That is the only solution to actually uh, escape from the Chinese strategy or of making us just more dependent upon, upon their supplies. In an emergency like, let's say, a war, is there another country in Europe or Africa that could supply the US with enough of these refined rare earths to keep them going for a short while? I've heard rumors that they can get these few volumes through the black market. The Chinese black market is for rare earths is absolutely huge. It is said that up to 40% of the production of rare earths in China is actually sold on the black market markets. So the US military could actually, that's what I heard, uh, get access to such resources out of official trails. Um, no, the question is, how do you access third parties? Well, uh, the Pentagon is interested in helping the Australians developing their um, their exploitation so that they could get some of the rare earths they need for, from Australia. And this is probably the latest and more most interesting move that I've heard in the rare earth space from the United States standpoint. Uh, so third parties do exist. They do exist today, possibly in, China, in, in, in Australia. But we should not be confused. It's going to take decades before we can escape the Chinese uh, hold on these minerals and uh, develop uh, sufficient alternative supplies out of Beijing supplies. Uh, it is a matter of uh, geopolitics for Beijing to stop the black market of rare earths. And they've been trying very hard for the last years to actually cut off these uh, black supplies uh, because they know that if they can control the, the, the industry, their industry, if they can uh, control the exploitation, uh, the business, the exports, they will be able to do what they already did with Japan, is just to cut off supplies completely uh, to Japan's for six months. So the very objective, the very goal for, for China is to uh, cut off these black market supplies to completely control 100% of what's being produced in China so that the geopolitics of rare earths makes even more sense to them. 
Rare Earths will be incredibly crucial over the next few decades. With the next wave of battlefield technologies and robots, stealth planes, and even the next generation of missiles, all requiring high amounts of refined rare earth materials. We need these materials to advance to the next stage of technology development. If the US particularly doesn't take this issue seriously now, do you think they'll be left behind in the next stage of the technology race? Rare earths are absolutely important and they will become even more important in the future. We'll find ways to substitute some of them by other metals, but given their properties, will we'll keep being extremely reliant upon these resources. And what has happened for the last decades is that we have left the Chinese, we have let the Chinese extract these rare earths instead of us, and we have let them control the business of these rare earths, go down the value chain, and get jobs in green industries and digital industries, notably because they could access the resource. And we have lost ground to the Chinese because of that. So the question is, do, you, we do, do we do for the next 20 years the same way we have done for the last 20 years? And in 20 years, we'll talk back again here on this show, Michael, and we will have lost ground to the Chinese again, notably because we don't have the resource. So there is really a, an economic war here, which is waged by the Chinese even if they didn't say so, which we have to understand. And we have to be back on track in the rare earth space in order to have a sovereignty of supplies, whether we extract these uh, minerals with third party countries or we extract them ourselves. But by one way or another, we cannot, we should not be dependent upon the Chinese in the rare earth space for the next decade. Otherwise, we'll get into trouble. Technology moved so fast. And I know it's cliche to point this out, but it was only 58 years between the Wright brothers' first 120 feet powered flight to the first man being shot into space. And the speed of technology is speeding up, not slowing down. Just in the last few years, we went from pages to brick phones to smartphones that many people, myself included, couldn't imagine living a single day without. And many people forgot to stop and think about the global supply chains that come along as a byproduct of this revolution. The computer I'm currently recording this on, the phone that I use, the satellite guiding my GPS users to get to work, all now have part of their supply chains that must go through China. A nation that more and more each day seems to be becoming frostier with us. So how do we get here? Why have we built this crucial weakness into our supply chains? Well, to talk about that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, what's mine is mine. Uh, rare earth elements are essential for the hardware and software of life as we know it. So if there's uh, something with a motor, regardless of how that motor is powered or uh, if something has a battery or if you have a piece of technology or if, we're, if you are building a rocket or the latest and greatest uh, high tension uh, steel bridge, chances are uh, rare earth elements are involved. Uh, rare earth elements are also really important for scientific and medical applications. So uh, some of the more familiar Applications are uh, their use in MRIs and various uh, medical imaging technology. Uh, rare earths are also used in some cancer treating drugs, uh, certain dental implants, and uh, they're also really important for uh, making state-of-the-art medical technologies actually portable. So, uh, so you, uh, we can take uh, important medical technologies out to remote areas and uh, provide medical care to populations that need it that might not be able to get into a big city with uh, fancy imagery machinery. So really just about everything you can think of that makes life uh, great in the 21st century requires rare earth elements. Julie Michelle Klinger is a professor of geography at the University of Delaware. She was also formerly a professor of international relations at the Frederick S. Pardee School in Boston. Julie is best known, though, for her amazing book, Rare Earth Frontiers, focusing on rare earths and their impact on the world going forward. She joins us today. Uh, rare earth elements are really quite common, as has already been established, but they are difficult to mine. And this is because they tend to occur in lower concentrations 
and they tend to uh, coincide geologically with all sorts of other stuff that's difficult to manage. Uh, sometimes this includes uh, radioactive materials such as uranium and thorium. And so right there, you have uh, an expensive operation that's just become much more complex because uh, it may involve a radioactive waste management situation. Um, but that's not the only reason why uh, rare earth mining is concentrated in so few places. Um, up until very recently, the uh, processes involved in uh, just doing the basic separation of you know, the couple of percent of rare earth elements that you want from the tons and tons of other material that you have to dig up out of the ground to get at these things involved really high temperatures, all kinds of different uh, funky chemicals, acids, things like that, and uh, generated a lot of waste, a lot of waste water, waste gases, and uh, particulate matter, uh, which you, know, you wouldn't wanna uh, hang around for too long. And so this had the effect of pushing uh, the rare earth industry into places uh, with either more lax environmental regulations or with weaker enforcement. And this, of course, had the effect of uh, cutting costs. And so what, uh, what a number of uh, companies and countries around the world have been trying to do over the past decade or decade and a half is to uh, selectively repatriate uh, different parts of the rare earth supply chain onto domestic soil. But the challenge that, that they've really run into is it's really difficult to compete with the China price. And a thing that I want to clarify about uh, the China price is that, yes, uh, uh, historically, you know, China undersold and outcompeted uh, other producers in different parts of the world, and in part because labor and environmental costs were so low. But I think it's actually not accurate to say that that's the primary reason why China remains competitive today. I think the reason that China remains competitive today is that over the past several decades, uh, the, the central government in partnership with universities and private companies has invested in building up a comprehensive uh, research development and vertically integrated uh, rare earth supply chain within China. And so once you have the investment in that, then you're already positioned as a more competitive player globally. Now, rare earths can mostly be divided up into three categories, light, medium, and heavy rare earths. Countries like Australia and the US have a very small capacity to refine the light rare earths, but China is the only country in the world who has the capacity to refine the medium and heavy rare earths. Why is it Australia and the US, with all their innovation and technologies, don't have a capacity to refine these heavy rare earths? That's a really excellent question, and I think the answer is actually straightforward. It's not that it's not that we don't have the know-how. It's not that we don't have the capacity. It's not even that we don't have the you know the the wish or the popular mandate to do such a thing. It's more that we haven't invested in uh, creating a context in which uh, we can develop in the U.S. or in Australia or anywhere else uh, the first couple steps of a vertically integrated supply chain. And, um, you know, often I think, I think it's more common to um, point the finger at uh, robust environmental and labor regulations, but I think that's actually missing the point. Uh, the point is, if you're going to have a, a good set of policies that protect people and the environment and to make sure that uh, industries go about their business in a socially and environmentally responsible way, that has to be coupled with funding or some sort of support, right? So that uh, so that firms are um, recruited and incentivized to do the right thing and to build um, the latest, greatest, greenest, and most sustainable operations um, wherever that may be, right? Whether that's on US soil or Australian soil or somewhere else. If it really is just cost and environmental factors, why haven't we seen someone like Russia or Brazil corner the market? You know, why is China emerged as the dominant player here? Well, I think the other thing is that it takes a lot of work to uh, develop and sustain a rare earth refinery. And I think it is worth pointing out that um, for the most part, you know, the U.S. executive branch and uh, several federal agencies uh, have been perfectly fine with the state of affairs of China being uh, the low cost 
uh, producer and source of rare earth elements. Um, you know, it periodically uh, is subject to public scrutiny. And I think the uh, more common public discourse is that the U.S. reliance on China is a problem. But one of the reasons why um, we haven't been able to repatriate the supply chain in the U.S., for example, is simply because, uh, you know, most of the downstream, uh, most of the downstream firms, whether these are um people working in working with government procurement or in the private sector haven't been particularly bothered by the fact that rare earth elements or um, uh, components containing rare earth elements are coming from China, simply because uh, for the most part, the supply has been reliable and they've been high quality and they've been cheap. One of the main worrying factors here is the worsening relationship between Washington and Beijing. Right now, a US F-35 fighter requires a lot of refined rare earths, both in its construction and in its smaller components, the little bits and pieces that make it work, all of which are made in China. If a war or an embargo was to break out between the US and China, would that break the supply chain here, effectively making an F-35 impossible to build on US soil? The thing that's critical for F-35s is not, for example, um, highly refined rare earths in their oxide form. It's actually specific technological components that contain rare earth elements. And so what's interesting here is that um, often what's lost in, in the excitement and confusion surrounding alarmism over a potential embargo is, you know, when people are talking specifically about rare earth elements, when in fact, the really critical thing are technological components that contain rare earths. Even if the US companies get Mountain Pass mine up and running in California, or Linus in Australia keep pushing forward with their rare earth operations and try to form a backup to the supply chain for the US, both of these companies are still private companies. That means they have shareholders and they have to make a profit. What is there to stop China simply repeating its playbook from the 80s and 90s, lowering the price of the rare earths and driving these Western companies back into bankruptcy, making their whole plan effectively obsolete? That's a really interesting question. And I think it actually uh, focuses attention right where it ought to be. So if, for example, um, you know, China were to flood the market uh, with low cost uh, rare earth elements uh, to the point where it would undercut uh, the facilities in Australia and the US, I think a big part of that would actually be on the governments of Australia and the US to respond appropriately. And uh, this is where I think actually looking at the successes that China's had over the, over the decades in building up its rare earth industry is really quite instructive. Um, as you said, it's never really been about the profit, and that is because uh, rare earths are strategically critical, at least if you want to have a high-powered, innovation-driven, uh, technologically sophisticated economy, which I think we all want. And so I think the thing that, um, the thing that we need to consider is um, whether, we, whether we should put a safety net in place in order to ensure that, um, that industries outside of China have the operating space in order to um, in order to survive these really critical, I mean, the first decade is really dicey for any mining company. And so in order to get them past that, uh, to the point where they can um, take over a greater share of uh, the global rare earth market does require a supportive policy environment. And, um, you know, if, if, all the, if not all the trading partners are operating according to the rules of, you know, a sort of laissez-faire free market economy, uh, then we have to take that into account and look at the situation as it actually is and not necessarily as how we would maybe like it to be. In which case, is this an industry that needs to be nationalized for the sake of national security and supply chains over the profits of private companies? should the government get involved in rare earth mining? That's a really interesting idea. I think that's probably um, that's probably a pretty extreme approach. I think that it'll be a combination of things. Um, you know, uh, subsidies are really important, uh, enabling and also providing incentives to downstream firms to actually purchase 
uh, rare earth elements that are and and technologies that uh, contain rare earth elements that are sourced from uh, environmentally and socially superior uh, facilities, um, and so. And so that, I think, can exist right alongside, say, you know, a publicly funded operation. And I think that I think that the market is big enough and important enough and um, and the needs for rare earth elements are diverse enough that we can have a combination of market subsidized and who knows, maybe special purpose uh, public entities as well. With this being such a huge issue for governments in the West going forward, why hasn't there been more public discourse about this? Why do you think this issue hasn't been front of mind in the mainstream conversation when it comes to mining and resource chains? I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, you know, it's important to remember that you know when uh, when the rare earth industry and manufacturing uh, was leaving the U.S. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, it was because it made good business and often good environmental sense. Um, so you know it. Uh, people made a lot of money by uh, offshoring their operations to other parts of the world. And, you know, for for environmental activists who wanted to see uh, mining sites closed down, uh, this was also good news. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, offshoring uh, or outsourcing uh, the U.S.'s rare earth and, and technology supply chain to other parts of the world uh, was government policy for decades, right? Because this was the most efficient thing. This was important to building a global uh, uh, free trade uh, regime. And so I think that that ideal still is still very strong. And I think that there's a good reason for that, right? Because global free trade is a great thing and it does great things for lots of people in theory. Um, what we're struggling with here is what actually happens in practice, right? In practice, it turns out that, you know, sure, some, some people really benefit a lot. It's really great for business to offshore operations to other parts of the world. Uh, but who loses out in that? Uh, workers and ultimately, ultimately the middle class, right? It often, it also um, can make good environmental sense locally, to shut down an operation that has a less than stellar environmental record, but that simply moves the problem to someone else's backyard, uh, which accumulates there for a while and uh, then eventually has to go somewhere else. And so I think we're really stuck between um, uh, the vestiges of our sort of 20th century ideals of what a global uh, free market should look like and the actual um, social, environmental, and political realities that come into play when we're talking about materials that have to be dug out of the ground somewhere, they have to be processed somewhere, and they have to be distributed somehow globally. And so in every step, there is the potential for conflict, uh, there's, the potential, um, there's the potential for destruction and devastation, and there is also aggravating that, um, the incentive to uh, cut costs, and unfortunately, that is often also met, meant cut corners. To someone who suggests we get around the embargo by buying a large wartime reserve of these rare earths in case a war does break out with China, would that actually solve the problem? You know, or would it just keep the can down the road? Well, uh, so there are efforts in different countries around the world to um, to rebuild uh, or to restore sort of Cold War era stockpiles of certain strategic minerals. And uh, that helps in some respects, um, but it doesn't solve the issue of the fact that, you know, most of or, or the middle part of the supply chain for many of our critical technologies that use rare earth elements isn't located in the US or Australia or Canada. Uh, it's these value added components that uh, we're importing from China. And so, you know, without really addressing that, right, without a robust reinvestment in, um, in research and development and uh, te technological innovation, uh, we would, you know, we'd be sitting on a pile of, of rare earth elements and, you know, without a, without a factory to convert them into the things we need. And so I think we need to draw, to shift our attention from the mining aspect, even though that's important, 
But I think that we need to shift our intention, our attention a little bit further down the supply chain to actually look at what the things are that we actually need, right? What technological form do they come in? And then do a much more careful analysis of what our vulnerabilities actually are. Because I think I think the, the picture would actually be surprising. And I think that we would find that we have a lot more tools at our disposal uh, than we might currently think. Rare earths is already a huge problem in our supply chain. Something we really need to think about. There's a realization there is no turning back now. Rare earths are a crucial part in our consumer electronics, the next wave of robotics, drones, fighter planes, and even hypersonic missiles. To give up on rare earths is to be left behind by progress. The next wave of cars and medical devices, but most importantly, the next wave of energy production will all require rare earths. Whether it be for the batteries in your solar panels or the mechanisms in the wind turbines, these elements will be required. We have a choice right now to either turn back towards the past and let a China-led world pass us by, or we can figure out the next crucial step in our energy production needs. And to talk more about that, we turn to our next guest. Part 3. The Next Wave Yeah, I think that rare earths and uh, energy storage materials are extremely important. I think that you know, society is really looking to transition to a uh, sustainable, renewable energy-based future. Um, people recognize uh, the, the harm that global warming and climate change is having uh, on our societies. And so, so there's a common sentiment of transitioning to sustainable, renewable energy. T. Gigan is the founder and CEO of EnergyX, a company closely tied with industry heavyweights such as Elon Musk, but focused on sustainable technology and the next generation of energy production. Teague is at the forefront of the next waves of energy production, as well as the rare earth materials that make it possible. He joins us today. Regulation and policy is following that, and uh, governmental bodies are instituting these, these policies to help push that transition along. And, uh, you know, we have pretty good renewable energy generation uh, ability, like the ability to generate the power using s solar or wind. But I think that energy storage uh, and battery energy storage is really the bottleneck. So I think that, you know, lithium and other battery materials are gonna be some of the most valuable uh, natural resources of the next 10, 20, 50 years. So society has moved energy sources dramatically in the past. For instance, during the First World War, we saw the dramatic rise to power of oil over coal, as oil was far more efficient for transport and powering battleships. And although coal has its place today, oil is most definitely the main focus of the energy market today. How do you think these big structural energy changes actually come about? And what do you think it will take for another one of these big changes to happen for us to move to another main energy source? You know, these are massive uh, economic and macro trends, uh, shifting an entire uh, energy infrastructure from one source to another source takes, it really takes decades and it takes billions or hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars uh, to accomplish. Um, and that, that's why these trends are so slow is because of the amount of investment that it takes. And it's not only the new investment that it takes, but you're also, uh, you know, essentially losing the old investment, right? Looking at the transition from coal to oil, you know, we used to have these big coal mines and uh, we, we were producing tons of coal and that was kind of where we were burning coal and that's what was powering trains and things and a lot of transportation and things like that. And we, we found that oil, we found that oil was a better way to do it. You know, 
although oil is you know harmful to the environment it's it's a lot less harmful than coal i think uh but it's also more abundant and more economical and that was kind of uh you know as it grew it became more economical and that's why that shift happened but that shift took probably 50 years to do right now we're in the same type of scenario where lithium batteries were invented about 40 years ago by Dr. John Goodenough. And uh, it's taken 40 years to get to the point where now we have several million ba battery powered cars on the roads and we're looking at commercial scale uh, battery storage. Um, but we're still only scratching the surface of that compared to oil and gas, right? Like, you know, we, it, it's about... 2% of the new auto annual auto production are electric vehicles versus combustion engine vehicles. Um, so this shift is going to take another 20 years. And although I think there's a pretty general consensus that electric vehicles are more sustainable um, and environmentally friendly uh, than combustion engines, it's still going to take that long. One of the main factors pushing for the move from coal to oil was the defense forces, with many nations and navies making a big push with their governments to move their ships to oil-based. Do you think the next wave of energy developments may come for the defense forces now, pushing for more efficiency with their technologies before it trickles down into the consumer markets? Yeah, I think that uh, the Department of Energy and, and the Department of Defense are huge catalysts for this transition. Um, there's, there's big budgets that are going into this. Uh, um, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful with where the policy is headed uh, in the new administration for that transition. As it relates to batteries and energy storage, uh, there are big budgets going into, into that. And I think that the Department of Defense realizes that um, we're, we've only scratched the surface of, of what battery uh, technology can be. I mean, if you think about Moore's law and how that's how that applies to computers um, and, and uh, like data storage, uh, there there's um, a somewhat similar trajectory in batteries. Like we're, we're still on, you know. We're still on generation one of lithium ion batteries. Like, you know, you can go back and look at lead acid batteries and, and different formulations of batteries, but we're still on the first generation of lithium based batteries. And looking into the future and what the, the roadmap looks like for battery improvement, you have scenarios where you're looking at uh, solid state batteries, you're looking at lithium sulfur batteries, you're looking at lithium air batteries that are orders of magnitude. Uh, more efficient in terms of energy energy density, cycle life, charging time uh, than, than our current batteries. And battery technology is going to get a lot better in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, for all those reasons, it's going to be very effective for military uses. One of the main elements acquired for these batteries is lithium, which unlike coal or oil, is only available in usable concentrations in a few select places around the world. It's also much harder to get out of the ground and refine than oil is. So can you take us through why lithium is so much more complicated to work with than let's say oil or coal has been in the past? All, all this stuff was uh, difficult before it became practice. That's kind of the same type of thing that we're seeing with lithium, right? Where in the beginning, you know, the first production methods are seem a little uh, difficult. But as more effort and more capital uh, is invested into the production of this natural resource, um, it becomes easier. And you know, a perfect example is you look at oil. Like once you get these pumps going, it's pretty easy to get it up. But you know, then somebody came along and invented fracking, and that made it five times or ten times easier. You know, they're producing another order of magnitude more oil using this uh, new technology and fracking. So the same kind of thing applies to lithium. You know, right now, 
there's two methods of production for lithium. Uh, one is your hard rock mining, your other is brine extraction. And, uh, you know, both ways are producing um, large amounts of lithium and, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons. Uh, well, there's about 300,000 tons total last year. But uh, people like me are working on ways to make those processes more efficient uh, so that uh, we can meet the demand um, in the next five, 10 years of multiple millions of tons per year, which is you know subsequently demanded by uh, the amount of batteries necessary to build electric vehicles. From a purely economic point of view and to play a bit of the devil's advocate here, what are the cost differences between digging up, let's say, a ton of lithium as opposed to a ton of crude oil? So I, I think that uh, there's two important considerations to factor in here. Uh, one is that when you're looking at a ton of oil, or I think that's like 43 barrels or something, that oil has a one-time use, right? You turn it into gasoline or you, you, know, you use it as crude and it's... Uh, it's gone. For lithium, um, you cannot, you know, it's an it's a energy storage system, right? So you can use it uh, thousands of times or thousands of different, thousands of cycles, uh, charging and discharging. And then once uh, that energy storage system or battery has degraded, um, and, and in the battery world, we consider uh, degradation when it goes from 100% capacity to 80% capacity. That's considered kind of like uh, the lifespan of the battery. There's several companies looking at recycling. Uh, so you kind of take the different parts, you take the different pieces apart of the battery and uh, you, you can either repurpose the battery or you can recycle it. But you don't you don't lose that lithium. So that's that's a huge kind of differentiating factor between uh, the production price, like what, what it is over the lifespan of that ton of lithium. You know, but, but the, the second thing is, so right now, lithium is uh, about $13,000 a ton. Uh, I don't know what, what oil is. It's, it's not even measured by the ton, really. It's measured by the barrel. But uh, th this is this is kind of we're, we're in the early stages of uh, lithium being a highly demanded material, and just like Moore's law, you you double in double in storage capacity and have in price, right? So I think we're looking towards a future where, as new technology is introduced uh, into the lithium production supply chain, there's going to be a scenario of, of I don't know about abundance, but uh, you know, more competitive prices uh, as more production and more technology comes online. There are so many countries around the world with some forms of oil deposits, obviously some more accessible than others. Where are we likely to find decent concentrations of lithium though, if lithium is so critical to the next stage of battery technology? So there, there's an area in South America that's actually called the Lithium Triangle. And it's pretty much the equivalent to the Middle East. You know, in the Middle East, you have uh, the UAE, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Kuwait, you have, you know, these huge, huge oil producers. Um, that area for lithium is the Lithium Triangle, which is made up of uh, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Um, and they have massive amounts of uh, lithium resources and reserves uh, in the form of brine. Um, so uh, the way that the way that brine is formed is these ancient volcanic formations uh, that are on the western side of the Andes mountain range, and then. The rain would fall, and as the rain finds its way from the mountains down to the ocean in this kind of circular water ecosystem, 
Uh, it forms lakes and, and places that it can't go through. And uh, these, these ancient salt lakes uh, have very high lithium concentrations. Uh, so that's, that's like the number one spot. Um, now, these types of scenarios uh, really happen all over the world. Uh, there's good lithium reserves in the U.S. The U.S. has about 17%. Um, estimated of the U.S. Of, of the world's lithium reserves, uh, a lot of that is in California, um, in uh, the Salton Sea. Uh, these geothermal brines. Some of it is in Texas. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of lithium concentration. The produced water that comes up uh, when big oil and gas companies are fracking, and then you know Nevada as well. Uh, that's kind of a uh, part of the California reserves there. But then there's also a lot of lithium in Australia. Those are more hard rock mines uh, in the green bushes. There, there's, a, there's a good amount of lithium around. Uh, some concentrations are, are better than others. There, there's like, you know, better spots to get it that makes it more economical. And that's really in South America. So the big lithium concentrations are better in South America but the majority of new lithium mines are opening up in places like Australia. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just that companies are hesitant to invest in long-term mining operations in places like Bolivia due to the political instability? Or is it knowing somewhere like Australia will be far more stable over the next 20 or 30 years, knowing that you, know, you can build a 20-year project and Australia will pretty much be in the same place in 20 years? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that just goes back to basic investment instincts like, you know, these, these countries like Bolivia uh, have immense geopolitical turmoil. And uh, although Bolivia just had a, you know, pretty democratic election and they're trying to change that and they're trying to, uh, you know, right the ship, they have a history, you know, they have a history of, of nationalizing resources and they just moved past their last president who tried to um, go against the constitution and extend into like a, a fourth term of presidency or third or fourth term, I can't remember. You know, that that's what, that's what people see when they look at countries like Bolivia. And then you look at Australia and it's been running smoothly for however many, you know, a hundred years. And, and it seems like a lot less risk to go there, right? So it's all about if you're putting a billion or multiple billions of dollars into an investment, uh, there, there's, a, there's a risk profile that needs to be uh, well thought through by the investors and politics play a large role in that. What am I in refining and actually making the batteries, turning the lithium to usable batteries in consumer grade technology? Who is leading the charge there? Yeah, so I think that uh, I think you know this this conversation can't be had without Tesla. Uh, you know, Tesla is is leading the world charge uh, in battery technology. Um, you know, they they started with the Gigafactory in Nevada. They have now have a Gigafactory in uh, Shanghai. Um, they're building one in Austin, Texas, and Berlin, and. Uh, you know, they are really vertically integrating this supply chain of, of building batteries and then building the electric vehicles. And uh, so, so they're, they're the world leaders, in my opinion. Now, uh, after them, you have really large battery manufacturers like CATL, which is the largest one in China, and, and BYD. And then you have, you know, more more common household names like Samsung, LG, Panasonic, and the, they're big battery manufacturers. So I think it's pretty well known that Tesla partnered with Panasonic to make their, you know, make the battery cells for some of their initial electric vehicles. And now Tesla has partnered with CATL in, uh, in China. Um, and then Europe is also doing a really great job of looking towards the future in terms of building these battery mega factories uh, with companies like Northvolt. But, but overall, I think that China is really leading the charge in the renewable sector in terms of energy storage production with batteries. 
and in terms of uh, renewable energy generation uh, with things like solar and wind. And why would China be getting so involved in renewables? They aren't really a nation you would associate with environmentally friendly green policy. So why would they be investing in batteries and renewables and rare earths? What do they stand to gain from this? It's all about the economics. Uh, I think that, you know, they have been behind the U.S. in virtually every other technology advancement. Uh, China has never beaten the U.S. in anything. The U.S. always beats China. And I think that, you know, within the past 10 to 20 years, uh, they really looked at, at renew and really even the past 10 years, they looked at renewable energy and their government started investing uh, copious amounts into uh, making sure that they became um, the go to for batteries. You know, like companies like Apple outsource manufacturing and batteries to Foxconn in China. Um, Tesla outsourced its battery manufacturing to Panasonic, although now they're now they're doing a lot of their own. And, and China really saw that as an opportunity and decided to invest heavily into the renewables sector. So, I mean, I think that that was a conscious decision by their government. And I think that they are really beating the U.S. in that sector. Time and time again throughout history, nations get caught in the trap of fighting the previous war coming at an issue with old ways of thinking. Whether it be France walking toward German artillery lines in World War I, or the lack of machine guns in the Brothers War between Austria and Prussia, the side who doesn't adapt with the times almost always loses. The Chinese are thinking ahead here, investing in green technology, knowing you can't cut a nation's oil supply off if they don't need much oil. Environmentalism aside, this next revolution in technology is here and the march of progress will leave nations who don't embrace it behind. But what can we do to catch up, and once again be on the front foot of the cutting-edge technology, to not fight the last war? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 4. Still Fighting the Last War So, rare earths are 17, 15 plus 2 elements on the periodic table, uh, from the family of lanthanides that were relatively unknown to the world, except they really make all our technology function uh, in the most efficient manner. If anybody has ear pods to listen to music, these contain rare earths. The magnets that make wind turbines uh, function, these contain rare earths. All of the you know major defense applications all contain rare earths. Rare earths are used everywhere in in everyday applications in our in our phones, in our headphones, in our life in general, and they make all of this technology function uh, more efficiently uh, as a result. So. This is why these obscure elements, when they became important, they also revealed how uh, they're everywhere in every application that we use in our everyday life. Sofia Kalanzakos is a globally distinguished professor in environmental studies and public policy at New York University. Sofia is also the author of two of the best books on this subject, China and the Geopolitics of Rare Earths and the EU, US and China tackling climate change. We are very excited to have Sevilla on the program today. There is a difference between knowing where they are and having set up mines to extract them. So I would say that while, you know, they're in India, you can find them in India, in Vietnam, in the United States, in Brazil, uh, even Europe uh, has some rare earths. The, the question is, who is the dominant player? And there's a lot of exploration, um, but having mines that can actually produce them is quite a different thing because it's very capital intensive and it requires at least a decade from the moment that you discover them to being able to bring them online. Uh, 
So it's not really a question of where they are located, uh, although that will play a role considering, for example, that we're able to find them now in the oceans or in the sands, which raises other environmental questions, which I can bring up later on. But the idea is who's set up to produce them at the moment and dominate the market. And obviously that big play we're talking about here is China. How did China come to be able to dominate the rare earth market? Initially, China wasn't always dominant in this area. First of all, nobody knew what to do with these materials. Uh, it was a question of the discovery also led to new technological applications in order to use them. So initially, the United States was dominant in this sector. In fact, they discovered rare earths in uh, Mountain Pass, California, when they were looking for uranium deposits because of the the competition with the with the Soviet Union over uh, nuclear uh, building nuclear weapons and nuclear nuclear technology. So the um, they thought they found uranium, but in fact they found rare earths. And since the 1970s, when that happened, they also began to discover, once they found them, they also started developing the R&D and they developed new technolo technological applications for which to use them. Uh, China came into this much later. Basically, they discovered rare, earth, rare earths in uh, Bayan Obo in 1927, and it wasn't until much later in the 50s that they built a mine in that particular area. And the rare earths were just a byproduct of iron extraction. After the 1970s, they too started seeing that this there were different applications for these particular materials. And they started developing an expertise for them, for the metallurgy, for you know, uh, what possible applications they could have, how they could use them, how they could process them. And by the 1990s, because they had so much uh, of these um, materials available in the tailings, they were able to uh, flood the market and create uh, such abundance that the prices dropped everywhere globally, which had the effect of either leading existing mines, like the one in the United States, into uh, bankruptcy, or to the curtailment of production, because nobody could compete. Because until that moment, um, I guess, the materials were considered, you know, a commercial resource. They weren't a strategic resource for the rest of the world. Uh, China, though, already in 1990, had declared that for them, rare earths would be a strategic resource because they saw ahead and understood the significance. One of the main reasons China can be so dominant in the market here is because they don't care much about the environmental damage this sort of mining and refining causes. In many cases, for instance, refining rare earth creates excess thorium, which is actually radioactive, something you would need to pay to store safely if you operate in a country with reasonable environmental protection measures. Does China just not care about the excess thorium, or do they have an environmentally safe way to mine these elements? It depends on what kind of rare earths you have, because some rare earths are heavy in thorium, like the ones in Australia, which really require management of nuclear waste in ways that, for example, other rare earths are not as attached. They don't have, they don't come so attached with with nuclear. Um, with like thorium that has that that has to be dealt with separately and for which we really don't have a use for uh i will say yet so basically it needs to be stored safely and that that is a problem now i want to talk a little bit about the environmental implications yes absolutely in the 1990s when china was able to produce more rare earths and export them and um dominate the market at very low prices, pushing competition sort of out of business or to the sidelines. Part of it was that it that this was also a time that coincided with new environmental regulations in uh, the West, Canada, Australia, uh, the United States, Europe. And it also coincided with China's 
incredible drive to industrialize and the beginning of its sort of going out uh, period. So yes, environmental, um, environmental regulation at that time was really lax. The additional problem in China was that up until very recently, uh, I guess after the 2010 rare earth crisis, there was a lot, uh, there were many, let's say mom and pop shops, if I could say it uh, like that, of producers of rare earths, which has led to a lot of smuggling, a lot of environmental degradation, because there was no oversight. It was, you know, there were really no rules in place. And yes, the processing of these materials can be highly toxic if uh, there isn't strict environmental regulation. And, and China has paid the price for that. Yes, they did manage to dominate the market, but until a particular, until, um, you know, environmental pollution became such a huge issue for China. Um, it was it was an issue that was sort of swept under the carpet, but can no longer be ignored. Which is why China is actually taking some very bold steps in trying to con not only control the industry because it's a sp uh, strategic material, but also because it really feels the need and it owes it to the people who work and live in these communities to you know protect their health and safety and and as we know you know none of these problems are are problems that um, affect only one region but they do have spillover effects so for example contaminating the groundwater system is not only an issue for the locale in which rare earths are being uh, produced extracted refined and produced but it does have effects all over the country. So yes, there is a drive to deal with environmental issues in China right now. So you mentioned the 2010 rare earth crisis. Can you take us a bit through what happened there? Here's the thing. Nobody really knew, or I would say layman, uh, had never even heard of rare earths until the crisis of 2010. It took a geopolitical dispute um, to really shine a light on the importance of these particular minerals for our modern way of life, for the tech, for defense, for decarbonization. Um, and what happened was in September of 2010, two incidents actually happened. The first one, the world uh, did not really pay that much attention to, but industry did. Uh, the second one, because it was a geopolitical dispute, really uh, drove, you know, attention around the issue of, of rare earths. So I'll start with the second incident that really, you know, was had uh, the ripple effects across the globe, which was that there was a trawler incident in the East China Sea. Uh, there's a dispute over the Senkaku uh, or Daewoo Islands, as they're called in Chinese, and the Japanese arrested um, a fishing vessel, a trawler, a fishing vessel, and held the captain and the crew. At that point, the China reacted very strongly uh, because the waters are contested by China, and there was a non-official uh, embargo of rare earths to Japan. This, and a few days later. Um, the captain was released by the Japanese. Now, this drew the attention of the world community because, as we know, you know these inputs are very vital for for Japan. That is a, a very highly industrial country that produces a lot of the high tech, and they're absolutely dependent. They were absolutely dependent at the time on feed coming out of China. So even though it was an unofficial embargo, it was perhaps the first time that China used economic statecraft to settle a geopolitical dispute, to uh, arrive at an outcome in a situation that had geopolitical implications. This alerted the world community to the fact that they were really overly dependent on these materials. However, a few months back, that same year, China had already um, announced that it was going to reduce the amount of rare earths that it was exporting to the rest of the world. And it had a quota system that um, in place and the amounts were reduced by almost half. 
this had already triggered a change in the pricing and alerted industry that the market would be tightening. But at that time, it was still considered a commercial event, right? One that um, I, would, I would say many economists, cornucopians in particular, would say, well, the market will resolve the problem. You know, we're living in a globalized world where, uh, you know, trade is free and unimpeded. And so it, it hadn't drawn that much attention. But when the, it came together with a geopolitical incident, the politicians, let's say, uh, got into the game and into play. And that's when the world was alerted through the media as to the importance of these minerals. Another major problem here is even if the US wants to get the mountain pass mine up off the ground and start digging these rare earths out of the dirt, the only place on earth that can actually refine these rare earths is in China. So even if the US got all of the raw neodymium and palladium they could ever need, they wouldn't be able to make it into a usable concentrate anyway, which seems like a pretty big problem in the supply chain. So what does this mean for, let's say, the US ability to build F-35s in the case of a conflict with China? Well, I know it's really important um, for the defense industry, you know, to have uninterrupted access to rare earths. And yes, the uh, F-35 is a, a really great example because according to a report of a few years back, it needs 920 pounds of rare earth materials. So you can imagine what that the importance that this has for the defense industry, right, and for national security. And the reality is that, that the United States has been dependent on China for rare earths to the tune of over 90%, 95%, 98%, which is the reason why, especially of late, or rather the Trump administration, um, in its growing competition with China, really put a tremendous emphasis on somehow uh, creating an increased level of security, supply security for the United States, trying to decouple from China. So I, I do understand the importance that this has for the defense industry, trying to be, you know, being able to build um, your defense uh, systems without having to rely increasingly on a strategic rival or because now China in the eyes of the United States in particular, is not, not viewed anymore as a competitor, but as almost like an existential rival in this new bipolar configuration that is being uh, proposed. Having China uh, monopolize the rare earth sector is no longer something that these other industrial nations can accept, especially if relations are going to be this competitive and fraught. All by way of saying that these critical materials like rare earths, but others as well, like lithium and cobalt, are now, we're, need, we're going to need to think about how we can have uh, uninterrupted supply chains and supplies and then supply chains because it's not only the minerals themselves but also the entire chain from mine to you know market um, that will allow for everybody to be able to develop to move to this next stage of economic global development this is also not a problem that can be quickly solved to build up rare earth mines refineries and production facilities for these kind of elements takes years or even decades time the U.S. may not have if relations with Beijing continue to sour at this rate. If Biden were to sign an executive order today, and we ignore all the backlash that would probably come from that, how long do you think it would roughly take to get the U.S. to be actually self-sufficient when it comes to their desperate and rare earth needs? Well, again, it's a question of uh, what kinds of rare earths, and I think that we need to also recognize that not all rare earths are equally valuable. So, for example, the lighter rare earths are more abundant and less valuable. The heavy rare earths that we need for magnets in particular um, and are, are more valuable and more rare. So uh, the question is, first and foremost, what kinds of rare earths does the United States have on its own territory 
So the question is, are we talking about finding ways to support rare earth production and bring mining back home? Um, and the other, the other uh, aspect that you mentioned is that mining, you know, from the, from the moment of exploration to putting all the fine, getting the financing and all the permits and all everything together, you need at least a decade. So this is a, this is both capital intensive and time and time consuming. And we, there is no way that anybody can go from being utterly dependent to uh, independent. So I, and also I, I believe that, you know, there can't be this kind of national independence because all of these technologies that we're using are very voracious consumers of the entire periodic table. So if you're not dependent on one thing, you'll be dependent on another thing, which is why when, when we hear conversations about why don't we uh, find a replacement, let's say for rare earths, can we just innovate out of our need for these materials? Well, the reality is, as I described before, given where the planet is going, we're going to need huge amounts of all the materials. Australia is one of the only places in the world that is even taking these kind of issues on board, even building a local capacity to refine light rare earths. But when it comes to the heavy or medium rare earths, China is the only place in the world that can refine these materials. Why haven't companies in Australia or the US even looked into building a capacity to be able to refine the heavy and medium rare earths? That does, of course, speak to the question of pricing. And up until now, uh, and into the future, I'm not saying the price does not matter, but definitely uh, part of it has to do with environmental regulation and the cost of not only building the refinery, but you know, you have to have the know-how, and then you have to build the, the the refinery, and then there are all the environmental regulations. And, and the costs of, of producing it. So there's nothing stopping per se, except I think some of this has to do with, as you said, cost, but also choice. So I think that the entire structure has been built out that has made it very hard for, um, let's say Australia to take it to the next level, although there have been efforts now what do you think it would take for governments to take the rare earth issue seriously and build up their supply chains independently? I mean, what's the question here? Is it that the United States is waking up to the realization that it's entirely dependent on China and now China is the strategic rival? If we're talking about that, yes, I think there's been an awakening in Washington that says, okay, this kind of constructive engagement that we've had with China up until now for X, Y, Z reasons is not working. This was particularly heightened during the Trump administration. So we went from Obama's, let's say, soft pivot toward Asia because they saw that that was where, if I may say, the action was. There was, you know, economic uh, growth happening. There was strategic interest for the United States. There was like China's spectacular rise. That, that worried the United States and, and they wanted to be close to their allies. Um, so for those reasons, we've already seen a pivot. Then Donald Trump came into the picture and transformed this kind of pivot and, and continued interest in Asia into a full-fledged uh, first trade war and then geopolitical confrontation, uh, very open geopolitical confrontation with China. Now, while the new administration is coming in that may not really want to be as, um, I, won't, I don't even want to say vocal, but maybe it, it won't be as um, openly confrontational. There's the, the suspicion is already there now. Uh, the groundwork has been laid and all political forces in the United States, including the business community, is becoming very suspicious of of china worried about china anxious about you know china gaining the upper hand covid made this abundantly clear 
that while you know the United States and Europe are, are you know flailing trying to control the virus, uh, China took the lead in recovering and introducing a lot of new technologies. So there, there's a growing realization that you know uh, the United States has to really you know think of China in a different way, and this of course spills over into the reliance for particular uh, minerals. We come across this regularly on the show, but there is no easy solution to the problem. If we stick where we are at the moment, then the US will be forever relying on China for these critical elements. And in case of a war, the US may be cut off from the supplies it desperately needs. And we need rare earths. And if we don't have rare earths, there's no new fighters, no drones, no robots, no electronics, and no missiles. A pretty significant impediment if you're trying to fight a war. We can't turn away from these either, as all of the next generation of cars, computing, and robotics all require these elements in large amounts. To turn away from rare earths is to walk backwards whilst China moves to the next level. But even if you want to build an independent supply chain, to solve this problem once and for all, there are more problems attached to it. This business is crucial, but not profitable. Companies like Linus are taking on the challenge and are mining these rare earths, but they still have shareholders to answer to. And if China feels like being challenged, they can simply just lower the price of their rare earths for a few months, flood the market, and send the price through the floor, to which these private companies then go out of business. So maybe the governments need to get involved. But then you come up against the fact that mining these materials is toxic and involves producing radioactive byproducts, making it expensive to clean and likely attracting huge public backlash as these heavy elements can breach containment and seep into the water supply. The big problem though is refining the materials, which takes huge amounts of energy and again risks leakage. Even if the Australian government was to opt in and say, let's do this and pick a spot way out in the desert where there's no water to be contaminated, more problems come with having to produce a large amount of power to be able to heat and refine these materials. Even using nuclear power won't work in this regard because you would have to have a large, constant supply of water to be able to feed the reactor, something the Australian and Californian deserts don't have. So you'd have to move the materials from where you mine it to somewhere where there is water, if you were to choose the nuclear option. Just to make this work, you would have to find a mine that has these elements in some sort of decent concentration. Mine it whilst also safely disposing of any rare earths that come from it, take it down to a hugely energy intensive refinery, which in best case scenario you would want to keep away from water supplies. That would probably mean building a whole new set of power stations just to keep the refinery going. And on top of that, you would need to be consistently delivering fuel to power the plant. And it's only after all these expenses that you can make the refined rare earths that you need. This is why everyone is hesitant to get involved here. Why would you want to spend all this money when you can simply just buy it from China for a low price? But sometimes what is easy and what is right are two different things. Without the pineapple, you can't make the Tropicano burger. And right now, without Chinese cooperation, you can't make the technology we rely on. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in this week. We've been working on this piece for almost two months now, and the more I dug into it, the more interesting it got. It's very different to our usual country focuses, but I'm looking forward to tackling more of these odd topic episodes. This episode is also a pretty special one, which has some great accompanying material coming out with it as well. So stay tuned to our socials for that one. If you want to read summaries of this episode or you want to find out more details, you can visit our website at www.theredlinepodcast.com or you can follow us on social media and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit and Discord on the handle at the Red Line Pod. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz. Oz is in Australia. By liking, sharing and commenting on our stuff, you really are helping the program. The show would not be possible without the support of our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep the show going. Our Patreons get to join in on games nights, live Q&As, and get extra materials from the show. 
our Patreon's donations all 100% go back into the program, helping us pay for staff, programs, hosting, websites, and lawyers that are essential with running a show like this. I cannot thank our current Patreons nearly enough for their support, and if you feel like you could spare a couple of dollars a week, we would greatly appreciate it. A big thank you to our guests this week. Guillaume Petron was fantastic to have on the program, and is still one of the best authors you could possibly ask for on this subject. Guillaume is one of the few people who has worked with both sides of the issue, and knows all the subtle details many people miss with it. I highly recommend you go follow him on Twitter at the handle Guillaume Patron. Julie Klinger is another person we were thrilled to have on the program. Her work on the geopolitical aspect of this issue has been fascinating, and she's brought a real elemental knowledge of just the way these materials are actually so important to our production chains. If you liked her work here today, you'll love her books on the subject, which you can find out more about on the Twitter handle at prof underscore Klinger. Teague Egan is at the forefront of the energy revolution with his company, Energy X. Each and every year that goes by, Teague's company is breaking new barriers when it comes to battery and storage technology. Energy X will be one of the companies that will likely go on to change the world when it comes to renewable energy, and we greatly support this all the way. It was amazing to have him take us through the green technology aspect of this problem, but there's a lot more to learn which you can find out by following Teague on Twitter at the handle at Teague Egan. Sophia Kalanzakos has her own amazing perspective on this issue, giving a fantastic and practical look at what can and needs to be achieved in this field. I had so many people put her name forward when I was looking for experts for this piece, and it's pretty easy to see why. I am very sure we'll have Sophia back on the program sometime soon. And if you want to find out more information about Sophia's work, you can follow her on Twitter with the handle S. Kalanzakos. As we mentioned a few episodes ago in our Ukraine piece, one of our patrons suggested we add a recommended reading list at the end of each episode, so people who are really interested in this week's topic can go on and read up further about it. So here are my three recommendations for this fortnight for Rare Earths. The first one is The Rare Metals War by Guillaume Petron. It took us through how conflict and tensions are rising out of the newly realized importance to these materials. My second is China and the Geopolitics of Rare Earth by Sofia Kalanzakos, who summed up the unfolding geopolitical game Beijing is trying to play here when it comes to rare earths. And my third recommendation is The Political Economy of Rare Earth Elements by Ryan David Kiggins for the technical side of how rare earths are mined, refined and sold to the market. This show only functions because of the support of my amazing team. Mark Spencer, who does the bumper speech to these episodes, is a crucial and important part of the team, and his show Climactic actually formed a good chunk of the research for this episode. Mark has been doing our chapter titles now since episode 7, and we are so lucky to have the best of the best helping us out with these. If you want to check out Mark's amazing show, you can follow him on Twitter with the handle at Climactic Show. Owen Swift is one of the most solid names in foreign policy that I've ever come across writing a whole series of amazing papers on a number of key subjects. Owen also rebuilt our website with a bunch of amazing articles and features and helps out quite a lot with the writing and research for the show. Owen has been a fantastic member of the team and is bringing more and more to the show each week. And if you want to find Owen on Twitter, you can find him at the handle Owen A. Swift. Joe Hawthorne helps us clean and prepare the audio to get this show up to the quality we're chasing. Joe is the reason this show sounds as crisp as it does. And if you ever wanted to hire Joe for yourself, I would highly recommend you do that as well. Joe is also working on transcriptions for a number of our episodes, so stay tuned for more amazing work from Joe. But if you want to find Joe on Twitter, he's located at the handle at JoeHawthorne77. The last thanks goes out to you for listening to the program. Every time I get a DM or an email from you guys, it always brightens my day right up. Every single one of you I've had the pleasure to meet over the last few years has been absolutely amazing. And I'm so proud to call some of you friends today. If you ever have any questions or just want to make a comment or even just reach out, you can always email or DM me at the show or find me on Twitter. I'm always up for a chat. We'll be back in another fortnight with another country-focused episode. But until then, have a great week. Thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. 
For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.